Welcome back. We are lecture 38, if I remember seeing that right. Okay, good. That was a good guess. Um, today we are going to begin section 8.2, which is on series. So the same kind of stuff we were looking at yesterday, but we we're just looking at individual terms. We're now going to be looking at the sums of those terms in that patterned array, whatever that array happens to be. I don't know that we'll finish with this section today. Probably not. Uh, but we'll just see how it goes. Uh, I think some of the problems, especially the first time through, they do kind of go slowly because we're developing formula as we uh, attack different kinds of problems. Once we develop those uh, algorithms, those shortcuts, I think problems from that point go quicker. Uh, so we are going on to series. Series means that we'll have the same kind of animals except we'll have a plus sign in the middle. So we've got a first term added to a second term, and they may be as such that we stop out here at A sub N, or they may, in fact, continue. So we could have infinite series, infinite geometric series. In fact, that's one of the ones that we'll cover today. So we're going to be looking at things, and a lot of times these will be given to us in a sigma notation, kind of a closed uh, notation as opposed to an expanded notation, where we have, um, we don't really have a description of what this is, but let's say a sub n, and n goes from 1 to 8, or if we want to let it go on, We'll lay that 8 on its side and make it an infinity. So there is a way to figure out the sum of some series that go on indefinitely. They have to be certain types in order for us to say that they converge. Uh, and, and these that have a specific starting point and a specific stopping point, certainly they will always converge because you're always going to be able to add them together. Uh, first example, let's look at... We're not going to put this into a category as much as just kind of examine how to tie sequences together with series. Let's start this thing at 1, and let's let it go. 1 over 2 to the n. n starts at 1, and we're going to let it go to infinity. Uh, one of the decisions we want to make is, is it convergent? And if it converges, uh, and we're able to do so, can we find the number to which it converges? So let's write out the uh, kind of what this looks like. The first term is what? One half. Second term is <coughs> one fourth. One eighth. Does that look right? And we're going to let this thing go forever. Uh, it is geometric. Why is it geometric? So by the end of class today, I think, if we get this far, um, you'll have a very good handle on recognizing when a series is an infinite geometric series and deciding if it converges and also the value to which it converges. So that'll be one of the, the goals today. Why is it geometric? What has to happen in a geometric progression or in this case a geometric series? We multiply by something as we progress. So as we go from here to here, from here to here, and so on, we've got the same number used as what they call a common ratio. What is the R value in this problem? It's one half. So you start with a first term, and we'll kind of categorize this a little better, but then once, whatever the first term is, first term doesn't have to be the ratio, which it is in this case, but in getting from the first term to the second term, you multiply by R, and getting from the second term to the third term, you multiply by r, and so on. If that's the case, it's a geometric series. 
this is an infinite geometric series because it continues indefinitely. Series, obviously, because we're adding these things together. So how do we tie together sequences from 8.1 to series in 8.2 and really the rest of this chapter? There is a sequence created if we take what are called partial sums. Called, pretty appropriately, the sequence of partial sums. So we look at the sum, and I know this is not a very exciting exercise, the sum of the first one terms of this series. That's a toughie. The sum of the first one terms would be one half. Then we go on, the sum of the first two terms would in this case be three-fourths. The sum of the first three terms would be what? Seven-eighths. Seven and we can continue that and we generate this sequence of partial sums We're not going to add these sums together because they are already sums in and of themselves. So we generate the sequence. The first term of the sequence is one half. The first or the second term of the sequence is three fourths. The third term is seven eighths. And then we analyze the sequence of partial sums to see if the sequence converges. If the sequence of partial sums converges, then this series converges. What would the next term of the sequence be? What's the sum of the first four terms? Fifteen sixteenths. Is that right? This is our first example, so we can just kind of make some guesses. Uh, what do you think? Do you think this sequence of partial sums appears to be converging on a certain number? Mm -hmm. And if so, what does that number appear to be? Mm -hmm. it appears to be getting closer and closer to 1. And we can continue the sum of the first 5, so we'd be adding in 1 over 32. What's the sum of the first 5? 31. 31 over 32. And you can kind of see the pattern now <coughs> that we're kind of doubling the denominator and the numerator is just one one behind that denominator. So the next term would be 63 over 64. So we do have this sequence. We're not adding anything together. We're just looking at partial sums. It appears that the sequence is converging to 1. Now, we can kind of validate generically that these kinds of series, when the ratio is in a certain category, do in fact converge. And we can also categorize the value to which they converge. But at least it seems somewhat believable, I think, with our first example, that the sequence of partial sums converges. And the sequence converges to 1. Let me put it in the uh, words of the authors here. If the sequence S sub n Remember yesterday we were talking about things in the curly braces, so it is, a, it is a set. If the sequence S sub n, the sequence of partial sums, is convergent, then the series itself, the one that generated the sequence of partial sums, is convergent. And we have a pretty good idea that this particular series converges to 1 because the sequence of partial sums gets closer and closer to 1. Now, how can we kind of make a generic description of uh, geometric series, get a shortcut for the sum of n terms of a geometric series, and then a further shortcut of when they converge when the ratio is in a certain category that is even quicker than um, 
if we stop at some specific value. So let's take an infinite, actually, let's stop this thing at, at, uh, at a certain number. But let's take an inf a geometric series. Now I'm going to make the first term A so we can talk about the first term in doesn't have to say anything about the ratio. The ratio is not involved yet. So the first term can be anything you want it to be. And getting from the first term to the second term, we're going to multiply by R. And then we're going to multiply by R each term as we go. So the second term times R is what? A R times R, which would be A R squared. The third term, notice this is the third term. How many times have we multiplied by the ratio? We've only used the ratio twice, even though this is the third term, right? So what's the fourth term of this series? A R cubed is the fourth term. So let's go out here to the nth term. That's exactly right. So by the time we get to the nth term, we will have used the ratio n minus 1 times. And if that doesn't seem quite right, look at the third term. The ratio is used twice. Not twice, it's in there squared. Fourth term has the ratio cubed. So the nth term, we will have multiplied by the ratio n minus 1 times, used, as a, uh, used it as a factor n minus 1 times to get to the nth term. So what would be a shortcut of all these terms added together? Just this particular line is not going to help us. So what we need to do is somehow come up with a shortcut that we can see what the sum of n terms in a geometric series would be. So let's take this and let's multiply let me back step a half step. We're going to form a new equation. If this is a legitimate equation, we could multiply every term by r, and it should also be a legitimate equation. So I'm going to take this value on the left side, multiply it by r, and I'm going to take every value on the right side and multiply it by r. So a times r, a r times r, a r squared times r, A R cubed times R. I left space for this next term. Um, if this has the ratio to the n minus first power, how about its predecessor? n minus 2, right? It has used the ratio as a power, as a factor, one less time. As you work your way left, it's always one less. Now, the reason I did that, what is this term times r? In minus 1. Because it'd be a r to the n minus 2 times r, right? r is r to the 1. And when you have product of things with like bases, you add the exponents. What's n minus 2 plus 1 would be n minus 1. So that's that term times r. And now what's our last term of the original equation? What's a r to the n minus 1 times r? a r to the n. If we added things, everything's going to hang around. Don't you see a bunch of like terms in the top line and the second line? So if we add them, we're not we're going to keep them around. If we see like terms, we might ought to want to subtract them if we want them to disappear. So let's take this first equation and let's subtract the second equation from it. That looks like a mess. The left side is s sub n minus r times s sub n 
tell me what is the end result on the right side. What is the top line, right side of the equal sign, subtract out this set of values down here? Close. Okay, we've got an A. Are we going to lose the A with any of these terms? So A minus zero. A stays. How about AR minus AR? Drops out. AR squared minus AR squared. AR cubed. Plus AR to the AR. This guy, all these guys knock out with all these guys, right? And then we're left with what? Minus AR to the N. That helped. What we really want is what is S sub N? Do you think we could massage the left side a little bit so we could solve for S sub N? Here's the left side. So here's our equation. Divide by one minus R. Yeah. Good. So there's really, you're kind of a step ahead there, So, but I know to get there you had to do this. We can, on the left side, factor out S sub N, right? It's in here and it's also in here. How many times is it in the first term? One. How many times is it in the second term? Negative R. So let's divide both sides by, which was suggested. At, Jacob, did you say that? Okay. Divide both sides by one minus R. That's a step closer to what is the sum of a specific number of terms, n terms, in a geometric series. Do you see anything that could be done, not that it has to be done, with the numerator? They both have an A, so we could factor an A out of this numerator, so that leaves 1 minus r to the n. That is awfully tempting to reduce that numerator with the denominator, but they do not reduce because this is 1 minus r and this is 1 minus r to the n, so they're different species, not only different animals, they're different species. So we're stuck with that, but that's still a pretty good shortcut. So let's take the series that served as our first example. 1 over 2 to the n. n started at 1. And let's, let's go ahead and stop this one. Okay? I think we, what did I, did I use an example where I stopped it? I didn't. So let's just make one up. Let's stop it at 5. Uh, we decided, I think, that the sum of the first five terms was 31 over 32. And we just added them together. And that's not such a bad idea on a problem this simple, but they're not all going to be this way, and some of them are going to be alternating. How could they be alternating, by the way? What's that say about the ratio if they're alternating? Positive, negative, positive, negative. The ratio must be negative, right? So if the ratio is negative, Every time you multiply the preceding term by a negative, doesn't it change the sign as you progress to the right? So if you've got an alternating series and you think it's geometric, you better be looking for a negative ratio. This is something you don't have to do. We're just kind of validating it because it's our first example. We're trying to see it through a little further. So we know at the last term, because we raised 2 to the fifth, so we use that last value, we already know by adding these up that the sum of the first five terms is 31 over 32. Now, can we get the same thing? Actually, that's S sub 5, right? Sum of the first five. So it should be the first term. One minus the ratio to the n. What's the ratio in this series? One half. N 
n is 5, all over 1 minus the ratio. So we've got a half up here. I'm going to leave that alone. Here we've got 1 over 1 32nd. 1 minus a half in the denominator is also a half. A half over a half, knock out. 1 minus 1 over 32. 31 over 32. So not a surprise. We kind of did the thing generically, so knew it was going to work and just kind of validated what we had previously. Questions on that before we try to take this particular situation just a little bit further? Wouldn't that be nice if everything in this chapter were that easy? Oh, infinite geometric series, they just progress along so nicely. and Oh, it gets a little rough when they're negative because it causes the signs to alternate, but um, no, it's not that easy all the way through. Let's take, and this is a, an example of this, which is why I chose this as our first example, not just because it's pretty easy. Let's take a situation where the absolute value of the ratio is less than 1. We know what happens if the ratio is 1 or larger in magnitude. Don't the terms in magnitude get larger? If you multiply by 1.2, don't they get larger as you go? If you multiply by negative 2, even though they alternate signs, don't they get larger in magnitude as you go? So those don't have a chance of converging. So if we want this thing to have a chance of converging, even though it's infinite, now we're moving on to this. A r to the n minus 1. That was our nth term description. n starts at 1. Let's go ahead, since we haven't really done it in this closed form before. When n is 1, what do you get? A. You get a, because it'd be r to the 0, which is 1. So the first term is a, which is what we want it to be. If you plug in n equals 2 into that description of the nth term, what do you get? AR. So that's what we want, right? First term is A, the ratio is R, so we're gaining a factor of R as we go. This thing does not stop, however. This one goes on indefinitely. So it is an infinite geometric series. And if we are going to use the ratio smaller than 1 in magnitude, so its absolute value is less than 1. Let's take a look at the sum well, n is headed towards infinity, so we're going to have a hard time plugging in r to the n if this thing goes on indefinitely. So let's analyze this particular piece if R is somewhere between 1 and negative 1. Let's say, I don't know, just for first example purposes, let's say it's a half. We've already used that one, so let's continue to use that one. What happens to 1 half to the N as n gets infinitely large. Doesn't that go to zero? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. 1 over 2, 1 to the n stays 1, 2 to the n as n goes to infinity keeps getting larger and larger and larger. What happens to a fraction whose numerator is fixed, no matter how large, and the denominator increases without bound? That is zero. Now, would that be the case with any value in this category? If I use two-thirds, would that also be true? If I use negative three-fourths, would that also be true? 
as long as the numerator is smaller than the de smaller than the denominator, whether it's positive or negative, eventually that fraction raised to the nth power. and n approaching infinity, those always go to zero when r is in this area. Isn't that convenient? Because r to the n, if r is somewhere between negative 1 and 1, this piece right here disappears. Well, we've got 1 minus 0. You know how limited I am, but I can handle that. <coughs> 1 minus 0 is 1. And the numerator is just a times 1, which is a. That's even easier than this one. You would think that if we let it go indefinitely, that it would be more complicated. It's actually easier. So if it's an infinite geometric series, and the absolute value of the ratio is less than 1, that's a critical piece of this. If that's not true, then what I'm about to write is not true. The sum, I'll just use s for sum. Um, we could subscript it with a little infinity sign. But the sum is a times 1 minus 0, which is just a over 1 minus r. That's easy. Infinite geometric series, absolute value of the ratio less than 1 it converges to first term over 1 minus the ratio. So our first example was this, 1 over 2 to the n. That ne doesn't necessarily look like most geometric series look, but we know it's geometric. And we're going to let this thing go on forever. What did we guess based on the sequence of partial sums what did we guess that the sum of this infinite geometric series was going to be? Well, that's if we stopped it at 5. It was 31 over 32. If we added in the next one, it was 63 over 64. If we added in the next term, it would be, what, 127 over 128? What did we think it converged to? 1. one. We thought it was going to head to 1. Let's see if we can prove that. This is really 1 half plus 1 fourth plus one-eighth, dot, dot, dot. This thing goes on forever. If it's an infinite geometric series, are you convinced of that? It's geometric because the ratio is one-half. By the way, ratio, you normally think of ratio as division, right? How do you come up with the ratio if it's not real clear? You take the second term and you divide it by its predecessor. Or you take the third term and you divide it by its predecessor. That gives you what r is. So it is a ratio. It's third divided by second, 11th divided by 10th. So in all these cases, this common ratio is a half. And it is infinite. So it's an infinite geometric series. Are we in this ballpark right here? Absolute value of the ratio less than 1. Yes. So this thing should converge to a over 1 minus r. First term is a half. 1 minus the ratio. The ratio is also a half. A half over a half is 1. So if we could add these up all the way to infinity, we'd get exactly 1. And we kind of made an intelligent guess at that based on the sequence of partial sums. So it is convergent. As soon as we know that it's infinite geometric and that the absolute value of the ratio is less than 1, those facts together tell us that it converges. And in this particular case, we know the value to which it converges, first term over 1 minus ratio. Questions on that before we go just another half step ahead? That doesn't seem like it fits. Repeating decimal. But it does fit because a repeating decimal is an infinite geometric series.
any decimal, let's dig back into our mathematical background, that's always fun to do, if a decimal repeats or terminates, what kind of number is that? I'm thinking I told you it was fun. Ago. <laughs> Not necessarily fun for you. The decimal repeats. This is a repeating decimal. Or it terminates. 0.25. That's a terminating decimal. That is a what kind of number? Rational, Rational number. number. Very good. So... Let's continue back in the memory banks. A rational number can always be written. I mean, normally when you think of a rational number, you think of a fraction, right? A fraction is a rational number. So any rational number, first of all, it's any decimal that repeats or terminates. If it doesn't repeat or doesn't terminate, what kind of number do we call that? Irrational. Irrational, not rational, okay? Doesn't repeat, doesn't terminate. But these, this is repeating. Even if it terminates, doesn't it repeat in zeros? So in, in essence, they're all repeating in this category. It's any number that can be written in the form of A over B. See if this sounds familiar. Where A and B are integers, and B is not equal to zero. That's probably the first definition you had whenever you had that, seventh grade, eighth grade. <coughs> The first definition of a rational number. Any number that can be written in the form of A over B, where A and B are integers and B is not equal to zero. It's a fraction. Rational number is a fraction. So this is a rational number. So we should be able to write this as a fraction. Not just a fraction. A fraction of two integers. And the denominator is not going to be zero, obviously. The first point three seven <coughs> isn't that... 37 over 100, correct? The next 37 we encounter is really 0 .0037 because we've already taken care of the first two decimal places. What is 0 .0037? 37 over two more zeros, right, than this, four zeros, 10,000? The next 37 we encounter would be 37 over whatever that is, two more zeros, and so on, right? So aren't these terms added together? The same as 37 over 100 plus 37 over 10,000 plus 37 over 1 with six zeros. Those are the same thing, and in fact, aren't they this guy right here? They are 0.37 repeating decimal. So is it a series? Yes, it's a series. It's infinite because this thing repeats to infinity. And what is the ratio? Well, if, let's take a half step back. Isn't that the first term? 37 over 100 is the first term of the series. What do you multiply by to get from the first term to the second term? 1 over 1,000 or 100? We've got two more decimal places to accommodate, so 100. So the ratio is 1 over 100. If it repeats in blocks of 2, it has a ratio of 1 100. Shouldn't we be able to find the sum? It's an infinite geometric series. So the sum should be first term, which is 37 one hundredths over 1 minus the ratio. So that's 37 over 100. 1 minus 1 one hundredth is 99 over 100. So can we write this rational number, we better be able to if it's a rational number, as the quotient of two integers? We certainly can, and it would be what? 37 over 99. If you don't believe that's 37, 37, 37 repeating decimal, take your calculator right now 
and take 37 and divide it by 99. Work, right? 0.37, repeating. So what's that written as a fraction? 14 over 99. 14 over 99, right? For repeats in blocks of two, like this, just like the previous one, check it out, 14 over 99. Let's just do a little bit of off-the-side pattern analysis here. Um, this is easy. Point 0.3, it repeats in blocks of 1, so the ratio would be instead of 1 one hundredth, it would be 1 tenth. So it would be first term over 1 minus the ratio, 3 tenths over 9 tenths, not a mystery that this is 3 ninths, right? So if it repeats in blocks of 1, it's ninths. You know where I'm headed with that one. Our old friend, 0.9 repeating decimal. Shouldn't it be the first term over 1 minus the ratio? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's 1. It's 9 ninths. There it is again. It just kind of keeps rearing its ugly head. I don't know. I think it's kind of pretty myself. 0.9 repeating decimal is actually 1. All right, let's go the other way. Let's say it's uh, 281, and it repeats in blocks of 3. 281 over 999. Check it out. Take 281, divide it by 999. All of this stuff just comes from the fact that if it is an infinite geometric series, the sum, and the ratio, by the way, is less than 1 in absolute value, which it is. It's A over 1 minus R. Now, the only other kind of problem that you might encounter other than blocks of 1, blocks of 2, blocks of 3 would be where part of it is stable and part of it's repeating. So let's say we have a 4 tenths kind of out there by itself. And the repeating stuff doesn't really start till we get to the 1 and the 8. So you do want to cast that non-repeating part aside. And we'll add that in at the end of the problem. And then deal with the part that repeats. Well, the part that repeats is slightly different from the way we looked at it earlier. The first term is 18 what? One thousandths, right? It's not in the first two decimal places. The first repeating block of two is actually covering the first three decimal places. Then once we take those and get rid of them, then this three zeros now in the bottom gets increased by two, right? because the ratio is now in blocks of two, it's one one hundredth as we progress. So 18 over 1,000 is our first term over one minus the ratio. The ratio is one one hundredth. One minus one one hundredth is ninety nine over a hundred. Not quite as easy of a fraction where we could just you know say there, this one's over a hundred, this one's over a hundred. Multiply numerator and denominator by a hundred, but we could multiply numerator and denominator by a thousand. So we should get. 18 over 990. Somebody with your calculator out, check that out. What is 18 over 990? Is that this? 
point zero one eight one eight. Yep. Got that? We're not completely done. We've got to add four tenths to that. So we've got to combine those two fractions. What can we do to the first fraction, 4 over 10, so that we can combine it with 18 over 990? That's about 99. Multiply by 99. 99, numerator and denominator. So now we've got 9 90ths in each fraction. What's 99 times 4 plus 18? Four, 14, is that right? So our final check would be to take a calculator and take 414 and divide it by 990. And if we've done everything correctly, we should be back to 0.41818. Does that work? So repeating decimals are infinite geometric series. Okay, we're not always given the series in the kind of a closed sigma format. We might just have it in expanded form. Did any of you go to see John Pizzarelli last night? Were any of you there uh, at the Canadian? Stewart Theater? No. It's a jazz guitarist and singer. Nobody was there. Man, you missed him. It was so good. John I to, Pizzarelli. I went to the comedian guy. It was good. <laughs> it, was, it was excellent. Um, yeah. But if you get a chance to ever listen to that person, if you like jazz, kind of an old-timer music like I would listen to from time to time, but he was unbelievable. Um, sorry, that's an aside. Uh, what kind of series is this? If you think it's geometric, I guess that's one of the reasons why I wanted this to be an example. What should you do if you think it's geometric? Second term divided by first term. And is that equal to, let's say, fourth term divided by third term? Is it? What is that ratio? What are we multiplying by? Negative, Negative one third? Is that correct? And you can check it out. Two times negative a third is this. This term times negative a third is this. This term times negative a third is this. So it doesn't take long, a few seconds to kind of validate that visually. Uh, so it is geometric. The dots that I see tell me it's infinite geometric. So if you are asked on a test, is this a convergent series? And if it's convergent, what value does it converge to? This is your justification. It's an infinite geometric series. What else do we need to say? The ratio is negative one third. And because we know the ratio is negative a third, the absolute value of the ratio is less than 1. If that's not true, it doesn't converge. Absolute value of negative a third is a third, which is clearly less than 1. Therefore, it's convergent. And can't we go a step further and find the value to which it converges? Yes, we can. And it is first term over 1 minus the ratio. First term is 2. Ratio is negative 1 third. Remember that we're subtracting the ratio. In this case, we're subtracting a negative. That's kind of hard to figure out, by the way, by looking up here, because they alternate. You've got 2, and then you subtract 2 thirds, and then you add 2 ninths, and you subtract 2 twenty sevenths. That's not necessarily visually easy to figure out. So it's better just to go right to this. That's 1 plus 1 third, 
which is 4 thirds. So if we could add all of these terms together all the way out to infinity, what would be the sum? Three halves. Three halves? Which is 2 times 3 fourths, which is 3 halves. I would have never guessed 3 halves by looking at these 4, 5, or 11 terms that we happened to write out initially. So this can be trusted as the sum of an infinite number of terms in a geometric series as long as the ratio is in this area right here. All right, good. So this is going to be perfect. We have one more thing with infinite geometric series to look at, and then we'll be ready to look at what are called telescoping series, and we'll start that tomorrow. Okay, this is slightly different because, well, a couple of reasons. It's got an X in the argument that talks about what we're going to substitute into. N starts at zero. There's our other difference. Most of the time it's common to start them at one because it's very handy to let N equal one generate the first term. Kind of seems logical. N equals two generates the second term. N equals three generates the third term and so on. It's kind of a little bit behind if you think of n equals zero generating the first term, but whatever we're handed here, that's where we're supposed to start. So what would this thing look like if we wrote it out? One. First term is one. one. Second term is x to, the n. x to the n, and n is one. So x to the one is one. x. When n is 2, x to the 2? Is that the way that series goes? Yes. Is that a geometric series? Yes. Yes. We're, multiplying by each term. We're multiplying by r, and r is x. x. So we multiply by x, multiply by x, multiply by x, and I know we don't know what x is, but it is x. The ratio is x. It is an infinite geometric series. If it converges, well, we've got a little big if there. If it converges, what would have to be true in order for this to converge? Okay. Absolute value x has to be less than 1. We don't know that because we don't know what x is. But if x were in this area, then it converges. And if x in absolute value is less than 1, this thing converges to this, which what would that be in this particular problem? So it may not look right to you, but 1 over 1 minus x is equal to 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed. So there's an infinite geometric series that represents this pretty simple fraction. And I'll put a little disclaimer here. If the absolute value, the ratio, which is x in this case, is less than 1. Perfect timing. We are at 10.05 minus about three seconds. 11.05, so I will see you tomorrow.